Kelsing spent 25 years on the PGA Tour and is a lifetime member of the PGA Tour and PGA of America. Now he provides his unique perspective as a golfer and network broadcaster. It's time to go On the Range with Jay Delsing. On the Range is brought to you by the Gateway Section of the PGA. Hey, good morning. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Uh, I'm your host, Jay. I got Brad Barnes next to me, and we got Pearly on remote. It's the remote Pearly. Pearly, give us a little update. Where are you hanging your hat today? I'm down in uh, Destin. Actually, I'm looking out. Uh, oh, there's a couple dolphins swimming by right there. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm on oh, the dolphins. Man. Can we today. turn the phone off? I know. That's just brutal. There's no <laughs> dolphins. He's probably sitting in a phone booth somewhere. Do they have phone booths anymore? I don't think so. No, they don't. All right. Well, the we, TV guide. We format <laughs> the show like a round of golf, and our first segment is called the On the Range segment. It's brought to you by the Gateway PGA. Please help me to congratulate the 300-plus men and women in our section that are helping to make our golf experiences better. The golf courses are full, and these PGA um, of America men and women are are making it happen. So please look uh, for these outlets, Pearly, on our social media. Uh, a little quick update on social media, Pearl. Go. Everything's, we had a huge week. Everything's going great. All right, cool. Way to go, Pearl. I want to thank Bob and Kathy Donahue at Donahue Painting and Refinishing, 314-805-2132. Um, if you need anything done on the inside or the outside of your home, these guys are super busy and do great work. Give them a call. Uh, they're terrific people. All right, so Pearly, we had a lot going on this week. I sat down and had a conversation with Nathaniel Crosby, uh, 1981 U.S. Amateur champ. Um, gosh, what a what a life this guy has led. I mean, to be Bing Crosby's son, at one point in time, Bing Crosby was off the charts as a crooner with the ratings, with selling records. He had a Christmas show. Nathaniel did a Christmas show for like 10 years with his brother and sister, like dressed up in sequins, he said, and bows. And, you know, he said he deliberately tried to sing off key so his dad wouldn't make him do it anymore. Uh, so I got a cool interview with him uh, uh, that's that's kind of fun. Um, man, I you, you know, we got to talk about the Open Championship and Colin Morikawa. I mean, this guy is, I'm going to say this. It's always fun to watch when the weather is calm because it's a little more, you see these crazy kind of built golf courses that are a little more uh, gettable. But I also, John, whenever the weather is that good, it's always a good sign for the U.S. player. Yeah, absolutely, and I was thinking that he played great. He deserves the win, all that good stuff, right? You play the conditions that you're dealt, but you just wonder how it would have been different. The other thing is, how would anybody have played that course with the darn if there was 20 or 30 mile an hour winds the whole time? I mean, every time they rolled into the hay, not every time, but a lot of times they're just slugging that bad boy back into the fairway trying to get back in play, let alone the uh, the greens. I, I, You know, they obviously mostly built it for there to be wind. So when there's not wind, it's pretty defenseless, even when they were messing with some of the pin placements. Yeah, that's it's right. And um, it's um, – I, I, I'm going to say this, John. Morikawa is the best iron player I've seen since Tiger. Well, he's obviously awesome. But I'll tell you what, how about the putting between him and Jordan Spieth? That's the part where I mean, in, in a TV – TV guys did a good job because it seemed like it was a uh, uh, knockout blows one after another after another. And these putts, I liked when they did the worm cam a couple times. They had one speed putt. I think it was a speed putt. I think it broke four different ways. Yeah, the back eagle putt. The eagle putt on forth. seven. Yep, yep. Yeah, how, how do you read that? You know, we're we're looking for you know one tendency here or there. That thing's wiggling back and forth all over the place. So. Yeah, the speed is obviously back with the putter. I didn't think he could ever get back there again. Now we'll see how consistent he can be. But he's back. It was a lot of fun. I just think for the British Open, when there's not weather, then it doesn't feel like the British Open right, as much. Right, it turns into and more like just another event. It does for me. How about, we got to talk about this, how about the finish that Jordan had on Saturday and how big that turned out to be for he not getting in the last group and him Falling short by two shots. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts? Oh, my gosh. The, 
<laughs> the little putt he missed on 18 was almost um, – I, I've never seen him miss a putt that short. I know he's human, but um, he certainly looked at, looked at there. And it's you know what, John? It goes back to I, I read some of the stuff he he wrote and said about this week. And he's like, man, I just uh, I, I I certainly played well enough to win this championship. But what happened to me? Where I made my mistakes? I'm like, he's like, man, I can't believe. That's where I did it, you know, and, and uh, a wedge in from the middle of the fairway on 17 and then three putting from 15 feet on 18. I mean, uh, it just shows you he's human. The game's hard. And uh, the, as, as even as benign as those conditions are, there's there's no gimmies out there. Pearl, that's going to wrap up the on the range segment, but don't go anywhere. I, I got to do the tip of the cap real quick. Uh, the tip of the cap this week is brought to you by the Dean Team of Kirkwood, 314 966 0303. Colin Berth, my man over there. I'm tipping the cap and bowing to Mother Nature. All right. She's an absolute force to be reckoned with when it comes to the game of golf. She can absolutely decide how this tournament looks and how it's played. And the Open Championship this week was a perfect example. People over there in Sandwich, England were getting suntan, and and they didn't know how to dress, and they didn't know where the sunscreen was. And uh, it was uh, just a different look. So the tip of the cap goes to her. And I want to thank the Dean team of of, uh, Kirkwood for sponsoring the tip of the cap segment. Colin and Brandy, give them a call, 314-966-0303. Back in a minute. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Hello, friends. This is Jim Nance, and you are listening to Golf with my friend, Jay Delsing. I want to thank the Gateway section of the PGA of America for supporting the Golf with Jay Delsing show. Um, There are over 300 men and women PGA professionals in over 100 golf facilities in the greater St. Louis area supporting us. They're experts in the game. They know the business of the golf, of golf. And at this point in time, this pandemic, the golf courses are jammed. These folks are working 10, 12 hour days and just doing great stuff and really appreciate them. Every time you pull up to a public course or a private course, a driving range, there's a really good chance by that that facility is run by a member of our section. Some of the examples of the programs that are run by these PGA professionals and the Gateway PGA section include PGA Reach, Drive, Chip, and Putt, PGA Hope, and the PGA Junior League. To learn more about the Gateway PGA, go to gatewaypga.org. To find a local PGA professional coach for your next session, go to pga.com. The PGA growing this game we love. Are you looking for a great career? Do you like meeting nice people, working with your hands, and fixing things inside the home? Marcon Appliance Parts Company would like to encourage you to consider a high-paying career in major appliances repair and service. Major appliance service technicians are in very high demand. Major appliance techs work regular hours and make excellent money. They work local, in their own communities, and are home every night. It is an incredibly stable industry and highly rewarding work. Discover more about your new career in major appliance services today by contacting a local appliance service company in your hometown. In Kansas City, contact Nick Turner at Consumer Service Company. The phone number is 913-541-0438. Marcona Appliance Parts Company is based in St. Louis, Missouri, and is the largest distributor of major appliance parts in North America and proud distributor of General Electric Parts. I am delighted to welcome Marie de Villa to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. I'm sure you know where it is, but in case you don't, Marie de Villa is a landmark out in West St. Louis County. It's located on the corner of Clayton and Weidman Roads. It's also on 21 beautiful rolling acres right on the way out to Queenie Park. It's a country club-like atmosphere. It's iconic, and it's absolutely gorgeous. When my dad died and my mom decided she didn't want to live alone, Marie de Villa was the first place we called. When we pulled up, we were greeted at the front door by the owner, and he took us around on a tour of the facility. We learned that there are one, two, and three-bedroom villas that you can live in, and there's also 24-hour care in the East, West, and the Waterford buildings. So Marie de Villa had everything that my mom wanted. One of the things that stood out in my mind as well was the way the family-owned business treats their guests. That's right. They refer to them as guests, but they treat them like family. So if you're in the process of trying to make a tough decision for this next part of life, you got to visit Marie de Villa. This is local. This is family. And this is St. Louis. This is Marie de Villa. 
Come be our guest. When things come out of left field, having a game plan matters. Farmers Insurance has over 90 years of experience helping people play through every stage of the game. We've seen almost everything, so we know how to cover almost anything. Talk to Farmers Agent Ed Fogelbach at 314-398-0101 to see how they can help you stay in the game. That's Ed Fogelbach at 314-398-0101. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Hi, Jay Delsing here for SSM Health Physical Therapy. Our golf program has the same screening techniques and technology as the pros on the PGA Tour use. That's right. SSM Health Physical Therapy has TPI, Titleist Performance Institute, trained physical therapists that can perform the TPI screen on you, as well as use the KVEST 3D motion capture system. It is awesome. Proper posture and alignment can help you Keep it right down the middle. There's 80 locations in the St. Louis area. Call them at 800-518-1626 or visit them on the web at SSMPhysicalTherapy.com. Your therapy, our passion. Grab your clubs. We're headed to the front nine on Golf with Jay Delsing. The front nine is brought to you by the Ascension Charity Classic. And welcome back. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm your host, Jay. i got Pearly with me, and we are headed to the front nine that's brought to you by the Ascension Charity Classic. This September, man, it's coming up. September 6th through 12th, Norwood Hills Country Club. You've got to come check out. It'll be the best field on the Champions Tour all year. And if you want to go see Jack Nicklaus, July 29th, he's hosting the luncheon at Norwood Hills with Tom Watson. Cool, cool. That's tall mm-hmm. cotton, even for you, Pearly, to be hanging around with. That's big stuff. That's that's the goat. Yeah, there you are, hanging around with goats again. I love it. Yeah. All right. So let's just go to this interview. Nathaniel Crosby. He's the son of the late and great crooner Bing Crosby, U.S. Amateur champion in 1981, Walker Cup captain in 2019 and 2021, both victorious U.S. teams. Let's go to that interview. Hello. Hello. How about that? What a way to do it. What a way to do it. Turn that around and now get to four. What about that? Nathaniel Crosby is brought to you by Golden Tea. I'm sitting down this morning with old friend Nathaniel Crosby. Buddy, thanks so much for reconnecting with me. I uh, I remember our days in college golf very well, college and amateur golf, and uh, you were the big, tall drink of water that uh, won a lot of matches and shot a lot of low scores. Uh, well, man, I really appreciate that memory. I, I wasn't really going to – I don't have that same memory, but – I do <laughs> want to talk about your you winning the um, – you've got a book out about your dad that's really cool. You won the U.S. Amateur. But let's start at the beginning, bud. Being the son of Bing Crosby, I mean, your dad was such a stud when it came to – he led record sales from 1930 to 54. His radio ratings were always off the chart. He was just almost bigger than life back then. You know um – in the book, I think the first chapter is called "As Famous as Famous Gets." Because my dad, upon you know being number one box office in the movie theaters for seven years and having more gold records than anybody in history by a wide margin, and um, you know he was in the spotlight for fifty years. And uh, but thirty of those fifty years, he literally had a radio show before television where he talked and hosted, you know, the top A-list celebrities um, for three or four hours, three or four times a week. So, you know, the craft music, uh, the craft uh, radio show. And, you know, that, that really created an intimate relationship between him and the entire country. And um, it's just amazing to hear some of the transcripts from those radio broadcasts, which lasted, you know, 30-plus years. You know, Nathaniel, there's something so romantic and so personal about that older generation. And just even the the PGA Tour event, your dad started the the Crosby Clam Bake, the Bob Hope Classic. All of these iconic guys had these events. They used to hang out there, and they they were present, and they were easily accessible. You know, 
the, the, the funny thing about Dad, among all the other accolades that he had, he was he was the founder of so many different things. And um, one of the first things that he founded was the Pro Am format. There was no such thing as a Pro Am in 1937 when Dad started putting his uh, golf pro buddies with his uh, A-list celebrity buddies from Hollywood at Rancho Santa Fe. And, um, you know, from then on, you know, to think about the, the format being used for all of the charities and raising money to support these tournaments on the Wednesdays, um, you know, it's been uh, an interesting tradition that he started. But beyond that, you know, he was the seed capital for frozen concentrate, frozen concentrate orange juice. He was the seed capital for Ampex. And uh, there's an article on the Internet about how my dad and the Nazis found the Silicon Valley because my dad funded uh, a, a defected, well, I can't, I can't say he was a full-on Nazi, but he was German in 1948 and um, had the patents. So my dad didn't invest in the company, he invested in the patent and formed the company of Ampax. So he was the original ground floor seed capital for Ampax and the cassette tape. So it's just amazing um, some of the things that he started, and um, you know it's it's uh, you know first Christmas show, first uh, American sportsman. He was a huge part of the first um, you know uh, really outdoor sporting TV show with the American sportsman. He didn't found it, Rune Arledge did, but he was a, a constant host with you know with the direction of Rune Arledge. So it's just interesting that he was on the ground floor of so many things. Oh, my gosh, I had no idea, but it doesn't surprise me. Nathaniel, what was it like growing up? So I know that your dad had a, a real strong opinion about you guys. You and your brothers, I think you have five brothers and a sister. You guys were not going to grow up in Hollywood, were you? Well, my dad's first family was four half-brothers, so they were considerably older. My dad was a widower. His wife died in her early 40s in 1940. 51 or two, I believe. And, uh, you know, my dad kind of checked it out. He had my brother, sister, and I, myself being the youngest, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. I was born in 61, and, and we, you know, he just didn't want us to be Hollywood brats. But, you know, the, the funny thing that I like to say about growing up in my, you know, as the son of my dad, was we, we had a 30,000 square foot house that my mom still lives in in Hillsboro, California. And I say, when you find yourself growing up in a 30,000-square-foot house, the chances of life, of negative trending through life are probable. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to get too much better than 30,000 feet. The chances of you having to accept lower accommodations as life goes on is, is more than realistic. It's, uh, it's almost a definite. Oh my gosh! What a what I, I had no idea. That is uh, amazing. Talk a little bit about the ranch and the ranch life, man. That sounds like my dad grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and and I always heard that that sort of life is really brutally hard work. Well, I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know where you leak that, but it's like the the thirty thousand foot house was in a suburb and and outside of San Francisco, so that was. Not a not necessarily a ranch, but my dad had a ranch outside of Mount Lassen in uh, or Redding, California, very top. And dad used to love to go up there fishing. And um, his brother-in-law or my uncle um, was, uh, you know, he was, he, you know, it was a pretty substantial ranch, a couple thousand acres with maybe a couple thousand head of cattle. And uh, we would, from age eight to age thirteen or age seven to thirteen. We'd go up there and bale hay and work cattle in excruciating heat. And uh, we learned to ride horses. You know, we had some horses, and we'd go on trail rides occasionally. But it was not a recreational summer. It was a beat down, you know, 12, you know, get the eggs from under the chickens at 5 in the morning. And I prayed to go back to the country club and hit balls by the middle of summer. And, um, you know, but it was a, it was a great uh, experience and you know dad wanted us all to have a strong work ethic and there's nothing you know you start bailing hay in 100 degree weather and at age 10 you're like you know, people like okay i've had enough 
Yeah, but, somebody uh, get me out of here. That sounds like for, awful. School to start. You're, you're wanting school to start again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Well, so let's jump a little forward to, um, although I, no, I, I read something, Nathaniel, that I thought was fascinating about an Irish nanny that kind of helped you learn about golf in the game. Is that true? Yeah, the, uh, Bridie Brennan, she was a lefty from uh, the town of, outside of Shannon, the, the town of Nina in uh, Ireland, which is near where you fly into to go to play in the West Coast. But she, um, she was, uh, I was her wee pet, as she used to say. And uh, she favored me over my older brother and sister, which was perfect for me as, a, as an adult, you know, as a, as a toddler. And we had a big backyard, so she taught me the grip. And um, I was out there chipping and, and uh, hitting pretty full shots. We had about 50 yards to work with there in some spots of the, of the yard. So, um, so I was able to hone my skills before I could go out to the big course at around age seven or eight, which then was the Burlingame Country Club. But she sadly died when I was about 11 and kind of, you know, was an emotional part of my upbringing, to her death. And uh, but I wound up coming full circle and naming my oldest daughter after her. So I've got a Bridget Crosby, who's now 26 years old and is the social media director of the Chamber of Commerce in Aspen, Colorado. Oh, my gosh. Fantastic. Well, it's interesting because I know that you had a, an opportunity to perform with your, your mom and your dad, your brother and your sister. And it just didn't seem to sit for you, did it? It just wasn't a fit. Well, I was kind of a jock growing up playing all sorts of different sports. And, you know, you come to school the day after 40 million, you know, because it was only NBC, ABC, CBS, and a local affiliate then. So when Dad's Christmas shows would air, and we did 11, so that took me from age 5 to 15, 11 Christmas shows. And I'd be dressed up in sequin green suits and dancing and shooting. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was humiliating. I'd go, I'd, I'd get in fist fights the day after those shows were aired. So I had a, I had a metal block, and then I, I intentionally looked unenthusiastic and sang off key. I think I was the first guy they've ever turned a mic off on on national TV. But you know, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. But then you went around, you turned around and won your club championship at what, like? 15 how the, how the hell did you do that well i was i was a good young player and uh had played in junior tournaments but i you know that was kind of my first stepping stone i won my club championship at age 15 16 and 17 and um you know it was a good you know i was actually everybody remembers me to be the fluke in winning the u.s amateur but i was the favorite to win the junior because i uh, I shot a course record to going to the U.S. Junior and beat the field by seven and then was medalist. And that rascal, Weeb Heinzelman from Baltimore, uh, beat me in the second round. And I'm, I'm, if Webb's out there listening, I'm still not over it. I'm still <laughs> mad about not winning. That was my junior to win, and, I, and he took me down in the second round. Uh, so let's go. Let's let's fast forward to college because this is when we met one another. You went at the University of Miami. You're in the University of Miami Hall of Fame induct, inducted in 2005. But Nathaniel, I played in the U.S. Amateur 1981, and Olympic Club was such a beast. The weather was cold. I can remember, you know, being a dumb guy from the Midwest going out to California in August in Northern Cal and and having one sweater and no turtle next no and we were freezing but the the golf course was just phenomenal and you winning that thing i don't know all about a fluke we all knew what a good player you were but talk a little bit about that experience to be able to hoist that trophy to be able to win a match play event that takes so much guts man um you know the the funny thing about it is is i was uh you know if i had a a bogey in my arsenal back then as a player, and um, I was I was one who was prone to take a big number. You know, it's like I would I would make a triple or a quadruple in a tournament and knock me out. And match play was always very comfortable for me because it didn't matter that much. And um, you know, to me, the hardest part of winning the U.S. Amateur was getting to the tournament back then because it was fifty-five or three spots or whatever it was, and um, 
you know, then, you know, once you got there, the metal play was much easier because the ratio was more like three or four to one. And um, then, you know, in match play to me, it was just about beating one guy every day. And your, your outlook on a given day or a given match was, you know, with all things considered, you've got a 50% mathematical chance of winning that particular day. And that to me, meddling was just a lot easier than, um, you know, trying to have the lowest score out of 145 guys or 165 guys in a metal plate tournament. But, you know, I, I came from behind in the finals and the semifinals against Willie Wood. Um, I think it was three down to Willie in the semis with nine to play and four down with 10 to play in the finals and really kind of, you know, stepped it up. And, you know, I think I kind of thought to myself when I was four down, you know, wouldn't it be something if I could pull this out and, you know, just flip the negative situation into a, you know, what if, what if I could actually pull this out? Wouldn't this be heroic? And, um, you know, I think I played a couple under par the last 10 or 11 holes and for 10 holes and uh, made a, you know, made the walk off 25 footer on the first playoff hole. But, you think about how hard that golf course was. I remember the metal play to get to the match play, which Willie Wood was in a playoff, was 17 over par. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's just a ridiculous. hard look back to think because the ocean course was much harder, or the ocean course was much easier than the lake. And, you know, most of my matches I was winning in, you know, two, three, four over par was what I was kind of shooting through, you know, 16, 17, 18 holes. But I can remember you at that 8802 and that silky smooth putting stroke, and you just were filling it up that week. I was I was filling it up in the when it can't, when it counted, uh, you know. But it was all it was all fun, and, and you know I kind of dedicated it to my dad. I had the the I had this uh, contestants medal, or what I thought was his contestants medal from when he played in the 1941 U.S. Amateur, and of course. It turned out it was a contestant's medal from another event um, because he played in the 42 U.S. Amateur at Wingfoot. But I was rubbing it for good luck on every critical five- and six-foot putt during the week. And, you know, Dave Marr, who was a friend of my dad's and myself, and uh, he was commentating, and Dave Marr was, there he is again, rubbing his medal. So it was he was uh, definitely out of a Hollywood script. If I, did, if I had a disdain for Hollywood, I kind of, you know, created a little bit of an event uh, with the with the uh, with the rubbing of the metal that uh, that was a good show. It was a good show. <laughs> hey, Nathaniel, whatever it takes, right? If we can make more putts, I'll rub it. You know, give give me something. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll take it. Yeah. But you know, but the other thing I, I I've got to say this: you you talk about a fluke, and I don't buy into that at all. You went and won the Porter Cup that next year, uh, and that event was and not that many people know about the porter cup except for we that played that's a that's a big win the porter cup yeah it was it was a great win and i came from behind in that one and that was really my big you know metal play event i was low in in the open that year at pebble beach but um you know including a one of my infamous high scores where i made a nine on the 14th in the second round but uh uh, but, you know, so I had a really good uh, following year to kind of validate the, the U.S. Am win. I won the Mid-Atlantic as well, which wasn't quite as strong a field. But um, um, but at any rate, uh, that's, uh, you know, that was a, it was a great validator. And then I had a great experience at the World Amateur um, in Switzerland and shot 68 in the last round. So it was a you know, where there was doubters, I think it was the third ranked amateur in Golf Digest in '81 after winning the amateur, and then followed it up uh, getting the same ranking for 1982. So uh, I think the critics were right about my professional uh, prospects as I uh, fizzled out on the European tour after three years. But, you know, it, there was a lot of um, uh, gratefulness that I was able to uh, play well the next year and kind of validate my U.S. amateur win. Absolutely, but also Nathaniel, you re- you got to represent the red, white, and blue in '83 on the Walker Cup team, and we got to talk a little bit about that because you you just came off from had to be a phenomenal experience captaining that the uh, the Walker Cup teams as well. So the the Walker Cup was an amazing experience at Royal Liverpool, but 
Uh, the funny story that's now a contemporary story is that my plane captain, uh, Jay Siegel, uh, you know, who's probably racked up the best amateur record since Bobby Jones in the last hundred years. I mean, he's just an amazing player. And I think he went on and turned pro in a senior to have a senior career where he won 12 senior tournaments, but he was our captain and we had a captain's dinner after I was selected where maybe eight or nine of the former captains, Bob Lewis, uh, you know, uh, Holt Greaves, um, you know, Siegel, uh, Downing Gray, a uh, bunch of these guys, Dick Sitteroff, Vinny Giles, Marucci, they were all at the center at Ruth Chris Steakhouse to wish me well and give me advice, as is the tradition of Walker Cup captains that are recently selected. And when it was Jay Siegel's turn to, to uh, give me advice, he said, you know, whatever you do, Nathaniel, because I don't know really what to tell you, but whatever you do, make sure you play everybody on the team three times. In other words, don't sit anybody twice. And, of course, he forgot that in 1983, he sat me twice because he considered that I was off. He, he was, you know, I was like, listen, I've had this chip on my shoulder for 38 years, and for you to give me that advice is BS. Yeah, <laughs> so you're I, damn right. I'm not happen. listening to that. <laughs> and and uh, and the funny part is, is I made it part of each one of my speeches. At the, you know, there might have been five speeches that I had to give, and uh, when I was when I was at the closing ceremonies after we won two years ago, I said, you know, this is deja vu all over again. I've been a part of two winning U.S. Walker Cup teams here at Royal Liverpool, and I haven't gotten to play in either one. <laughs> <laughs> and Siegel, Siegel was in the front row listening to all this, so I, I, got my, uh, I got some humor back at him and got a little bit of revenge after 38 years of feeling feeling like I got miffed with uh, being being uh, put in the chair twice in the 1983 matches. Okay, so that's going to wrap up the first part of the Nathaniel Crosby interview, but don't go anywhere. We've got the back nine coming up. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. If you have a car and you're struggling to get some protection for that car, let me recommend Vehicle Assurance. 1-866-341-9255 is their number. They have been in business for over 10 years and have a 30-day money-back guarantee, which is one of the reasons why they have over 1 million satisfied customers. They are known for their painless claims process and their premium vehicle protection. So whatever that car looks like, they can help you. You can find them at VehicleAssurance.com or call them again at 866-341-9255 for a free quote. Get the protection and the peace of mind you deserve. Professional Golf returns to St. Louis in 2021. The Ascension Charity Classic, presented by Emerson. Stars like Phil Mickelson, Ernie Els, Jim Furyk, and more compete at Norwood Hills Country Club, September 6th through the 12th. Tickets, clubhouse passes, hospitality suites, and pro-am foursomes are on sale now. All proceeds go to North St. Louis County Charities. Visit ascensioncharityclassic.com or call 314-938-2828. PGA Tour Golf is back in the loo. The Ascension Charity Classic. I am with my buddy Joe Sheezer from USA Mortgage. Hi, Jay. How are you? Doing great, Joe. Thanks so much for the support of the show. Ah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, congratulations. This is uh, your third year, and we're really proud to be a sponsor all three years since the very beginning. It's a great show, and we look forward to it every Sunday morning. Well, thanks a bunch. Tell us just a little bit about USA Mortgage and what you can do for people. Well, USA Mortgage is a uh, ESOP. It's an employee-owned company, so over a 1,000 families here in St. Louis work for the company. So if you want an opportunity to patronize a, a local company, please call USA Mortgage 314-628-2015 and I'll be more than happy to sit down with you, go over your options, discuss all the different programs that are available and give you an opportunity to support a local company. That's awesome, Joe. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm your host, Jay, and this is my Gateway PGA section spotlight this uh, week is Mike Surrey from Oak Brook Golf Club in Edwardsville. Mike, thanks for joining me this morning. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jay. So, gosh, you're doing such great work for the for the junior, uh, the PGA Junior Golf League. You've got the biggest program in the country. You also have a really special uh, thing going at Oak Brook Golf Club. Tell us a little bit about it, please. 
Yeah, you know, I, I grew up on the golf course. Uh, my dad and grandpa built the course. My dad was a PGA pro, went to Q school. I tried to follow in his footsteps. Uh, my mom was a school teacher, and uh, as it turns out, I ended up not quite good enough to make it on tour, but I, I enjoy uh, coaching and teaching, and so uh, we're, it's very unique out here. We have 27 holes, so it allows us to always be able to get kids out there, and uh, my parents have given free golf. I mean, they work a little bit, but give, essentially given free golf to the high schools for the last 43 or 44 years they were actually both just inducted into the illinois coaches hall of fame and they've never coached in their lives so um you know uh just growing up with that and seeing how um when you give back to people uh it, it actually may it, it's actually better and you know you always hear it's better to, to give than receive but you know when you can go out and hang out with families and hang out with kids and and see that you're giving them a life skill that they'll be able to, to do and experience the rest of their lives as a family um, and just personally, um, it, it's really rewarding. So that's that's why my junior league program is so big because I, I just have a passion for it and I really enjoy that um, I see that these people are, are learning the game that has given me so much. And Mike, it's in your DNA. I mean, hell, your grandfather built Oak Brook, and now you're taking over the family business. The PGA Junior Program, as I said, is the largest in the country. You were the most recent uh, president of our section here, the Gateway Section. You also sit on the National PGA Junior League uh, Committee Board. So just terrific stuff all the way around. Yeah, I, you know, very fortunate. I, I've, you know, uh, had a lot of opportunities and you know, the situation I'm in out here has given me the ability to um, grow and expand. And then, um, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to find something that you love to do, uh, it's not work. So um, then when you're not working and you're having fun, um, everybody else has fun. And then you get a little bit of recognition, which is great. But obviously, it's all the people um, that support what I'm doing um, that, that get me that recognition. So um, it, it's all for them. And But just, you know, I'm fortunate to love what I do. He's Mike Surrey. He's at Oak Brook Golf Club in Edwardsville, Illinois. Check him out on the web. They're doing great stuff with the PGA Junior League. Mike, thank you so much for jumping on with me today. All right. Love it and love the show. You've seen it and played it in bars over the past 30 years, and now you can bring Golden Tea to your home. Complete your basement or man cave with the popular arcade game, the ultimate virtual golfing experience. Over 80 courses, unique game modes, and you can even challenge a buddy in online tournaments. However you play, you will be the talk of your neighborhood. Visit home.goldentea.com to learn more. I want to tell you about Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. My friend Colin Burnt runs the store over there, and he helped me buy a used Volkswagen for my daughter, Joe when she turned 16. We've had the car for over a year. It's running great. It's nice and safe, and we've taken it there to get it serviced just recently. Pearly, that does the show with me, just bought a nice Toyota truck from Collins. So I want you to know that if there's any sort of vehicle you need, anything at all, you can get it at the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. You can call them at 314 314- 966-0303 or visit them at DeanTeamVWKirkwood.com We're halfway there. It's time for the Back Nine on Golf with Jay Delsing. The Back Nine is brought to you by Fogelbach Agency with Farmers Insurance. Welcome back. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm your host, Jay. I got my favorite caddy and, uh, hey, are you ready for the Ascension Charity Classic? You better get your ass hey, in shape out there. I did my miles. I did my miles today. I was doing push-ups today. I had no sugar today, no salt today. Uh, must have been miserable beginning. for the king. <laughs> must have been miserable. miserable. <laughs> but that's the first step towards many steps going to be taken in Norwood to drag you to victory. Right on, right on. All right, well, we're headed to the back nine, and the back nine is brought to you by the Fogelbach Agency with Farmers. 314-398-0101. Any type of insurance for your family, for your business. Call Ed today. He's got his family members working there. They're terrific people, and they will help you out. 314-398-0101. All right, let's jump in to the next part of the interview with Nathaniel Crosby. Nathaniel, what about what now? Back to school? Uh, I guess so, you know. I've got all my girlfriends doing my homework for me, so I better get back. <laughs> Nathaniel Crosby is brought to you by Golden Tea. 
you know, Nathaniel, when I when I sit here and I, I just reminiscing with you, it's so uh, awesome how you've made your career uh, and, and how how golf has just been right in the middle of the things that you've done in your life. It you know it's um, it's been funny. Um, I think I played three years on the European Tour and I was kind of negative trending. I think it was eighty eighty fifth on the money list my first year and then uh, uh and then i wound up uh going to 115th and then 155th and retired in front of my girlfriend and my dog at the ripe old age of 26 but um you know it, it was a great experience and then i got the opportunity to get in the golf equipment business um with the tony penna golf company and you know i, I guess in a look back it was not a good idea in 1988 to buy a persimmon wood company with a group of people from San Francisco, uh, the Cavalli family. And, um, you know, it's, it's just like, uh, I think they said on the movie, other people's money, the fastest way to go broke is to be, uh, the leading player in a shrinking market. <laughs> you know, so don't be the guy with the buggy whip when cars have just been invented. So I bought a, persimmon wood company when metal woods were replacing uh, persimmon thrown into the deep end and learned hard uh, you know very quickly and uh, but I, it, it became the Nicholas golf equipment company and we grew that to about 25 million and um, then later uh, well, I took the direct response strategy which I was trying to get the Nicholas company to execute and um, we did that with Orlemar so I was really part of the direction of the, you know, lead sales for the uh, Orlemar Golf Company in the late eight, uh, late nineties, when we were the fastest growing company in golf industry history. We went from one to 103 million in a year. And uh, long story, I have to have Oprah Winfrey in the room to, to explain, or Dr. Phil, or somebody to <laughs> explain how we didn't make a bunch of money on that one. But, uh, but we were a hot company. It, it was a great experience and. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been great. So, uh, very privileged and lucky to be in the, in the golfing world and, and have a name to, uh, to try to bounce off people and get projects started. And I've definitely been a serial entrepreneur since, uh, since I left competitive golf. Oh, it's, it's just amazing. But so Nathaniel, talk a little bit about Tony Penna. I mean, I can remember that name. That name was back around back in the early early days and did um he was re- reputedly one of the best uh driver makers for years i mean we're talking about for decades well you know he had uh i mean it was back in the day it was about skilled craftsmen and um you know tony was not only a player on the pga tour he led he had the McGregor contracts from uh, Rand Fricky and, um, you know, McGregor was the number one market share. Tony was trained the craftsman. He'd set up the distribution with the, with the club pros who were in many cases were playing the tour locally. And he went on to win, you know, their, the official wins, I think are five, but I think he actually won seven uh, PGA events all the while. So, he would. He signed Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson. Signed Jack Nicklaus. Signed White, his latest Weisskopf, uh, I believe, to uh, McGregor, Jackie Burke, Jimmy Demerit. So he was really one of the key people to giving McGregor number one market share for 40 years. He got a little bit of publicity because I think when Molinari won on the tour, it, it, um, it was the first time any Italian American had won <coughs> on the tour since Penna which I think was 1937 or eight or something like that. But, you know, he started his company when he left McGregor after they changed ownership in the late sixties. And Tom Watson uh, won all of his majors with Tony Pena Woods or Tony Pena Driver anyway, uh, Trevino, uh, Gary Player, uh, the little Seve, Ballesteros, Nick Price. Uh, the list goes on and on and on uh, about how many tour players used Tony Pena Woods before, things flipped over to metal. 
Uh, Nathaniel, I can remember, and I still have a Tony Penn and McGregor driver downstairs in the basement. I still look at it. I got rid of most of my wo- my wooden stuff, but I won't get rid of that because it's just special to me, and I can remember when I first got it. It's uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great experience because you know you walk into a, one of the great things about walking into a company is like when you're actually making something locally and you have a factory and you got your office and distribution in the front, but you have you know people actually making the product in the back. There was something truly gratifying about that, and and um, being part of the golf equipment business, we were at the forefront of the outsourcing. And Metalwoods were initially, because we were in the Metalwood business as well, as we had to be, but Metalwoods were originally made in foundries in California, in uh, Oxnard and San Fernando Valley, and Taylor Made in Callaway and, and others were also getting the products made there. And in 1992 or three, we all started to go to Taiwan, and all of these factories with thousands of employees closed down. And, uh, you know, we were getting the same product for, you know, one-third the price and making more profits, but there was no factor anymore. We were all, we all just became marketing and distribution offices. So, uh, you know, and then Taiwan got lost all the business to China about four or five years later, where we started getting all of the foundry work done in China. And it's just, um, it's kind of sad when I look around because I'm a big, uh, I'm a big promoter of trying to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And, you know, without getting political, it was just, uh, uh, an obvious, I was an obvious part of it, uh, because I had to be, because there were no, there were no foundries left in the U S to make golf clubs. And, um, uh, it's just very sad, uh, in a look back and you see some of these parts of the country, the, R- the Rust Belt and, and uh, not just the Rust Belt though, but many parts of the country that, lost all of these factories that made, you know, they were the original equipment producers or the original equipment manufacturers, and uh, they're all gone. And uh, these towns really struggle to this day after losing their, uh, after losing their factories. All right, that's going to wrap up the back nine. We're going to head to the 19th hole and the conclusion of the Nathaniel Crosby interview. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. This is Bill DeWitt III, president of the St. Louis Cardinals, and you're talking to Jay Delsing. And wait, oh, sorry, what's the name of the show? <laughs> Golf with Jay Delsing. Oh, yeah, let me start it. <laughs> Are you looking for a great career? Do you like meeting nice people, working with your hands, and fixing things inside the home? Marco and Appliance Parts Company would like to encourage you to consider a high-paying career in major appliances repair and service. Major appliance service technicians are in very high demand. Major appliance techs work regular hours and make excellent money. They work local, in their own communities, and are home every night. It is an incredibly stable industry and highly rewarding work. Discover more about your new career in major appliance services today by contacting a local appliance service company in your hometown. In St. Louis or St. Charles County, contact Brian Propes at AAA Home Services. The phone number is 636-299-3871. Marcon Appliance Parts Company is based in St. Louis, Missouri, and is the largest distributor of major appliance parts in North America and proud distributor of General Electric Parts. I know you've heard me talk about Whitmore Country Club. I want to thank them for supporting the show again for the third year and tell you things are going great for them. There's 90 holes of golf when you join at the Whit- at Whitmore Country Club. The membership provides you access to the Missouri Bluffs, the Links of Dardeen, and the Golf Club of Wentzville. Cart fees are included. There's no food or beverage minimums and no assessments. 24-hour fitness center is fantastic. There's two large pool complexes uh, and three tennis courts. Stop in the golf shop. you got to see my buddy Bummer. He is an absolute great guy that would love to help you with your game and love to show you around um, the uh, facility. He and his staff uh, run golf leagues, skins games, members tournaments, couples events. There's live music. There's uh, uh, great dining opportunities out there, outside, inside. Anything you and your family need golf-wise, fun-wise, visit WhitmoreGolf.com or call them at 636-926-9622.
Don't miss the hottest rookie class in PGA Tour Champions history. Stars like Phil Mickelson, Ernie Els, Jim Furyk, and more compete at Norwood Hills Country Club September 6th through the 12th. Join legends Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, and Hale Irwin to celebrate the PGA Tour Champions' newest event. Professional golf returning to St. Louis in 2021. The Ascension Charity Classic presented by Emerson. Tickets, clubhouse passes, hospitality suites, pro-am foursomes on sale now. Visit ascensioncharityclassic.com. Hey, Jay Delsing here for SSM Health Physical Therapy. Do you want to have a more consistent golf swing? Hell, I know I sure do. SSM Health Physical Therapy's golf program has Titleist Performance Institute certified physical therapists trained to assess your movement patterns, your mobility, and your stability to help make your golf swing more efficient and repeatable. They can help your golf game. There's 80 locations in the St. Louis area. 800-518-1626 or visit them on the web at SSMPhysicalTherapy.com. Tell them Jay sent you for special pricing. Your therapy, our passion. Let your local farmer's insurance agent, Ed Fogelbach, put his experience to work for you. Ed Fogelbach proudly serves St. Louis area families and businesses and is ready to review your existing policies or provide a no-obligation quote today. Call the Fogelbach Agency at 314-398-0101 to get smarter about your insurance. Again, that's the Fogelbach Agency at 314-398-0101. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Grab your friends, a cold one, and pull up a chair. We're on to the 19th hole on golf with Jay Delsey. The 19th hole is brought to you by Michelob Ultra. And welcome back to the ninth hole. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm Jay. Pearlie's with me. And we are going to the end of the Nathaniel Crosby interview. I hope you enjoy it. Nathaniel Crosby is brought to you by Golden Tea. Tell us a little bit about 18 Holes with Bing and how our listeners can can get a hold of this copy. I know you've sold out your first um, run there, I think. Yeah, we Harper Collins was our a publisher and and uh, it was a fantastic uh, run and you know I think the way, I'm trying to understand the way the book industry but works but I think I almost have to buy some books myself to get some book signings done at clubs which I've been doing on occasion and um, you know but it was a it was a, a, lo- a labor of love to write a book about my dad and the funnest part was to research his life before I was on the planet. And you know, understand what he meant to the country. I think the the, the most meaningful was the the launching of the USO, which was organized originally by FDR with my dad and Bob Hope. You know, who were still barely of age to fight, and um, you know, be put in combat. But uh, FDR, uh, despite my dad campaigning, and the only time he campaigned for Wendell Wilkie against <laughs> Roosevelt, FDR. FDR turned the cheek and, uh, you know, put Dad and Bob Hope in the USO in the very beginning, along with so many other celebrities from Hollywood, to inspire the troops. So my dad was literally 30 days behind Normandy invasion, and he was working at a General Omar Bradley's headquarters. And, um, uh, you know, the Fred Astaire told him, he said, if you don't see power lines, you're likely to be in enemy territory. And my dad, my dad's daily exercise there for months was to sing about five or six songs to a platoon, which might have been 60 troops. And then he'd drive with a Jeep driver about five or six or 10 miles to the next area where there'd be another platoon of 60 troops, and he'd do the same. So he might do four or five or six of those a day. And... Uh, the driver goes into this town called San Mary Glees, and sure enough, there's no power lines, and my uh, and there was no sign of humanity in this town. And my dad looks around and says, "This is a little spooky. We'd probably better get out of here." So the jeep driver turned around and they went back, and sure enough, uh, you know, the the uh, next day, Omar Bradley asked my dad, "You know, what towns were you singing in yesterday?" 
and he mentioned three or four towns, and he said, and send Mary Gleese. Said, send, Bradley says, send Mary Gleese. That's an enemy hand. My dad says, I can't believe you've lost it already. I had it under control yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's but the, the truth of the matter was the, the Nazis used to flip the signs around to confuse the oncoming advance of, uh, of the Allied troops. So it wasn't, uh, but there was undoubtedly snipers in the town, but they didn't want to blow their position shooting at my dad and the Jeep driver. You know, so, it's unbelievable. So, I mean, uh, you know, my dad was my dad was in the London bombings, and you know, with the V two rockets, and and uh, he, you know, he had uh, a big role, and you know, it was, it was amazing contribution from uh, you know during the war years for my dad in uh, offering morale to the troops, along with so many other celebrities that put themselves in harm's way back then. It's just incredible, Nathaniel, you know, never having fought and, and really appreciating our service, men and women. It, it's just unfathomable to think of someone like your dad riding around in a Jeep over in, you know, w- right in the middle of the war. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. You know, you know what's unbelievable is as we look back at history, and, and I don't know how you feel about it, but as I can get older, you know, distant history becomes, you know, when, when I was a learning about World War II in high school, it seemed, you know, lifetimes before me. And as I get older, I'm thinking, wow, you know, that happened only, you know, 20 years before I was born, uh, you know, or less than 20, 17 years before I was born. And, you know, when you look back at it, you're looking back at it knowing the result of the war. But when these guys were doing their activities, they were in the middle of something. They did not know what the outcome was going to be. And I don't think anybody really reads history and appreciates, you know, the dedication and the willingness of of so many of these uh, families across the United States and across England and, you know, that that had to go through that time of turmoil because they just didn't know how it was going to come out until the very end. No, it's just absolutely incredible. Man, Nathaniel, thank you so much for the time, the information. I could sit there and listen to you tell stories about your dad and the history and some of the inside scoop that you have. I really, really appreciate it. Is there a way that we can buy this book? Are, are you? Um, is it on Amazon? Uh, well, you know, yeah, it's been on Amazon, but I think you might be better off trying to find it in Barnes & Noble. Um, it was a bestseller, and uh, right now we're scrambling, but there should be some paperbacks available or or uh, used books available but we went through 75,000 copies so I'm trying to lobby him to get a little bit more uh public you know maybe get a few more thousand out there so I can find sign do some book signings at uh, at some clubs and promote apple tree but um I gotta ask you a question before we get off the air you played in the group in front of me did you play Jim Holtgrieve in the group in front of me at Brookline when Bernice was taking me down no, I got I got waylaid by Jim Gallagher, who chipped in twice on the back nine to take me down and beat me one up, and I still haven't gotten over that. Well, that was a tough day for both of us then, because I, I made an 80-foot putt on Pernice to go one up, and I'm going to say we had six, 7,000 people watching just our match, and I made the Justin Leonard putt from the front of the green at the back right 10th place and on 17 to go one up. And that rascal, Tom Pernice, birdied 18 from the bunker and made an 80-foot or 50-foot putt on the first playoff hole. And I've really never liked him ever since. (laughs) I make it a point to root against it. I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. These golf stories, they don't die easily, do they? Oh, man, it's right on the tip of my shoulder right now. It's still... I still have a grudge against Bernice. <laughs> All right, Pearl. We only have a couple minutes left. That interview was long, but I thought it was really fun. Um, your biggest takeaway? I'm sorry, I have two. I, just the incredible golf career he had in so many different high-profile manners. It was awesome. I, I remember, as you do, you were there playing when he won the U.S. Amateur, and none of us that were playing a lot of amateur golf at that point thought, saw that coming. And he wanted it a spectacular course and everything else. Jay, the one other piece that uh, he brought up was uh, 
uh, the critics. He mentioned critics, and I got to believe that was through uh, relative to his father's career, the family in general, both career, uh, his post career, everything. That's just one of those things when they're that high profile had to be tough. And uh, he's still so grateful and thankful for everything else. But uh, that, that's one of those tough pieces that uh, at some point, if you ever talk to him again, if he was open to it, would be interesting to hear more about that. Well, Pearl, that's going to wrap up another show. Uh, me, thanks so much for taking care of us. And uh, we will see you next week on Golf with Jay Delsing. Hit him straight. St. Louis.